you take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. The Russ we Belleville love. Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah! Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. Good day, tokers and tokets and non-toking lovers of liberty. It is Wednesday, December 2nd, 2015, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we begin today on a sad note, uh, as we have to too often here in the United States of America. The breaking news this afternoon of a coordinated mass shooting in San Bernardino, California, uh, authorities looking for three men allegedly clad, uh, uh, clad in body armor, carrying long weapons, uh, some described as AK-47s, uh, at a center for the developmentally disabled. It's like uh, Newtown and the, and the kids getting shot up. Uh, you thought it couldn't get any worse. But no, this time at a center for the developmentally disabled, three men well-armed, body armor, uh, accounts so far 14 dead, another 14 injured, uh, active scene. They still got people on lockdown. And coming through my Twitter feed, I saw a tweet from Asha Bandela from the Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, no finer human being on the planet. She's a, a wonder. She's just a, a, a joy. And uh, her sister, apparently, was it? Um was uh, uh, on lockdown and she had worked, she works there and, and apparently is okay at the m moment. But uh, I mean, this, this is hitting close to home. And I think we're at a point now in America where everybody knows somebody uh, who's involved in uh, or, 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 you know, uh, has been touched by gun violence in America. And this isn't going to be a show where I go off on what we do about it other than, are we going to do anything about it? because <laughs> we've tried nothing over the past couple, three years, and apparently that's not worked. So I'm open for all sorts of suggestions. I, I just don't like the idea of, you know, random bullets in public places. That's what I want to stop. That's, that's what I want to see stop. And if we've got some suggestions for that, hell, we can talk about it on uh, Toker Talk Radio. That's coming up in hour two, 4 p.m. Pacific time, top of the hour. Uh, live call-in number is 971 533 7111. And of course, where this happened in San Bernardino is just blocks away from the National Orange uh, Center, uh, where they have uh, the High Times Cannabis Cups and the Kush Cons and a bunch of other events that they have out there. So I'm kind of familiar with the area. And it's just terrifying. It's just awful. And um, of course, where uh, condolences go out to anyone who's been directly affected by this uh, latest mass shooting. And, and while I was looking that one up, there was a shooting at a uh, women's health clinic in Houston, Texas, and the uh, details are still developing on that. But for today's show, uh, we are going to get back to talking about marijuana. And we've got uh, in behind the headlines, we're going to talk about the stoners against legalization rearing their ugly head this time in the state of Arizona. Phoenix New Times has a big feature article on that. Then uh, we got a Ladies of Legalization segment where Maya Salovitz, uh, someone who I just admire the hell out of, I love her writing, uh, especially for Time and the Healthland column. Uh, she reports on the drug war and she was a part of the Drug Policy Alliance Reform Conference on a panel on coerced treatment, you know, drug courts and all that. And then we'll finish out the show uh, with my radical rant uh, because Oregon, is going to ban cannabis cafes starting on January 1st. I've got the latest details on that. But we start everything off with, with the cannabis radio news that's coming up right after this break. I'm Radical Russ. Stick around. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. son of a Polish immigrant who grew up in a Brooklyn tenement. He went to public schools, then college, where the work of his life began, fighting injustice and inequality, speaking truth to power. 
He moved to Vermont, won election, and praise as one of America's best mayors. In Congress, he stood up for working families and for principle, opposing the Iraq War, supporting veterans. Now he's taking on Wall Street and a corrupt political system, funded by over a million contributions, tackling climate change to create clean energy jobs, fighting for living wages, equal pay, and tuition-free public colleges. People are sick and tired of establishment politics, and they want real change. Bernie Sanders, husband, father, grandfather, an honest leader, building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, and I approve this message. MJWellness.com, the largest medical marijuana community in the world. Connect with thousands of patients, doctors, industry leaders, and businesses through shared personal experiences along our worldwide network. Discover new therapies and benefits with content tailored to you. Come grow your network on mjwellness.com. You're not alone. Your wellness matters. Learn, live, and thrive. Check out mjwellness.com today. It's time for the Cannabis Radio News, covering the latest headlines in consumer cannabis, medical marijuana, and industrial hemp. Cannabis Radio News is now available exclusively at CannabisRadio.com, featuring reporting from the Associated Press. Now, your marijuana headlines in 4 minutes and 20 seconds in the Cannabis Radio News. This is your Cannabis Radio News for Wednesday, December 2nd, 2015. Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto came out strongly against legalizing marijuana on Wednesday, the same day his government announced a national public debate on the issue. He suggested the recent informal debate on the issue has already created confusion even among his own children. Mexico's Supreme Court ruled in November that growing, possessing, and smoking marijuana for recreation is legal under the right to freedom, but that ruling applied only to the four people involved in the case. Earlier, Interior Secretary Miguel Angel Osorio Chong announced that the government will open a national debate on the use of marijuana, with public sessions to be held in the second half of January. Mexico has decriminalized possession of very small amounts of marijuana, but activists want to go further, moving toward legalizing recreational and medical uses of pot. Polls show a majority of Mexicans oppose legalization. The U.S. Postal Service office in Portland delivered some potentially bad news last week to Northwest newspapers. If news outlets run ads for the region's booming marijuana industry, they might be violating federal law. The Friday memo pointed out it was illegal, quote, to place an ad in any publication with the purpose of seeking or offering illegally to receive, buy, or distribute a Schedule I controlled substance. If an advertisement advocates the purchase of clinical marijuana through a medical marijuana dispensary, it does not comply with the law, end quote. The memo quickly caused confusion and concern among publishers whose newspapers have published ads for dispensaries and manufacturers in the region's now two legal cannabis industries, medical and recreational marijuana. Staff members for Oregon Representative Earl Blumenauer and Senator Ron Wyden confirmed the offices talked by phone with the U.S. Postal Service to hear more about the issue. They say they have asked for clarification from the agency on, quote, what appears to be an outdated interpretation of the law, end quote. Minnesota Commissioner of Health Dr. Ed Ellinger announced Wednesday that intractable pain, as defined in Minnesota law, will be added to the list of qualifying conditions for which patients can legally access medical marijuana. The commissioner must notify the chairs and ranking minority members of the Legislative Health and Public Safety Policy Committees. Intractable pain will become a qualifying condition for medical marijuana effective August 1, 2016, unless the legislature passes a law stating otherwise. The vast majority of the 23 states with workable medical marijuana programs allow the use of medical marijuana to treat intractable pain. Medical marijuana in Minnesota doesn't actually mean access to the cannabis plant. Rather, patients in Minnesota must use only non-smokable marijuana products obtained from one of two operational manufacturers. 49% of Arizona voters support and 51% oppose the idea of recreational marijuana legalization, says the poll released on Tuesday by the Morrison Institute at Arizona State University and the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. 
Not surprisingly, the poll showed that Democrats, independents, and people under 55 favor cannabis legalization far more than Republicans and senior citizens. David Daughtry, associate director at the Institute, says the results don't bode well for legalization because only 29% of Republicans said they favor the, me the measure. Quote, it is important to note, he said, Republicans and older adults vote in larger numbers than either Democrats or young adults, which would, at least at this point in time, uh, point toward likely defeat of the legalization of recreational marijuana, end quote. The 2010 Arizona Medical Marijuana Act passed by a mere 4,300 votes out of about 1.7 million ballots cast, or about a quarter of a percent margin. The Seattle City Council is moving closer to new rules that will make room for more marijuana stores in the city, but some in the business said the plan doesn't go far enough. At the same time, the plan faces a legal challenge for going too far. Under the proposal, marijuana shops and greenhouses would still have to stay 1,000 feet from schools, but the distance from libraries, parks, and child care facilities would drop to 500 feet. That would add nearly 40% to the land available for marijuana businesses. But the council was, as the council was considering the zoning rules, lawyer Douglas Hyatt was in King County Court to challenge the city's right to impose any marijuana rules at all. He said the city has no right to regulate a business that is still illegal under federal law. This has been your Cannabis Radio News for Wednesday, December 2nd, 2015. I'm Russ Belville. The Russ Belville Show, providing dictionaries to drug czars since 2009. Imagine life without taxes. Let New Era Certified Public Accountants, NewEraCPAs.com, handle your Cannabis 280E in tax strategy. Get your business prepared with New Era CPA's Cannabis Finance Boot Camp. NewEraCPAs.com, with years of experience in the industry, we are one of the nation's leading accounting firms for growers, dispensaries, and ancillary companies from Washington to California. NewEraCPAs.com. Great websites today need expert web design and development and need to be e-commerce ready and mobile friendly. But building a marketable and profitable website can be an uphill climb. Ready to make your new website or replace your existing website? Think Orange as the new way to get in the black. Orange Hill Development works with Fortune 500 companies and offer the same top quality development service at a fraction of what other providers charge. Brands like Absolute, Carlsberg, and Nest T trust Orange Hill Development. Find out why you should trust your website with Orange Hill. Contact Orange Hill for a consultation today at orangehilldevelopment.com. Today in Behind the Headlines, we take a look at the continuing saga of stoners against legalization. This time we focus on the state of Arizona where the Marijuana Policy Project has a version of what they call the Campaign to Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol, or CRIMLA, uh, working to uh, legalize marijuana in Arizona. The recent headlines, they've turned in uh, 100,000 or so signatures. They're well on their way. Uh, looks good for being able to collect enough signatures and make it to the ballot. And working against them, of course, are you know people like... Maricopa County attorney Bill Montgomery and all of the state apparatus and the cops and the prison guards and all the typical opponents of marijuana legalization, the big rehabs and so on. But also we've got a situation where marijuana activists are fighting against this. And the story is up at the uh, Phoenix New Times. You can find them at phoenixnewtimes.com. The story by Ray Stern is Hardcore pot activists want marijuana legalized in Arizona under their terms or not at all. A story from uh, September, and it's just uh, beginning to uh, uh, really generate a lot of heat down there. <laughs> Pardon the pun for our Arizona listeners. But uh, Jason Medar is at the center of this, and he's with this group called Arizonans for Mindful Regulation. And uh, he was also, it turns out in this article, a uh, dispensary owner in California who fought against Prop 19 back in 2010. So we've got a Stoners Against Legalization link going all the way back to the original Stoners Against Legalization in 2010. And uh, Medar, of course, is one of these legalizers who believes there should only be true legalization, that there's too many restrictions on what, what's coming out of the Marijuana Policy Project. And 
vows to fight it. And that, this is where I've got the problem, right? Because you're not going to find me often on the side of defending marijuana policy project, but here you will. And it's because there's legitimate complaints with what they might propose in an initiative. Uh, as far as I think the Arizona one gives far too much control, local control to the banning of home grow. And MPP has been kind of, you know, there's the story that we, we covered yesterday with Dan Riffle leaving MPP and citing the fact there's too much industry influence and MPP having to get buy-in from dispensary owners in Arizona and the, the, uh, the medical marijuana they've set up on the East Coast and Minnesota and these other states that are very, very anti-home grow rights. And that's something that I think is very important about legalization is that we have the right to home grow. And this latest story here, you know, there's legitimate complaints I could have about this, this MPP Arizona initiative, but I wouldn't fight against it. It's not worse than the prohibition, especially the prohibition they have in the state of Arizona with a possession of this, the minor fleck, this, this fleck of marijuana can get me felony time, get you locked up with hardcore criminals. So to fight against something that would end that for the vast majority of marijuana consumers is just unconscionable. And sometimes the argument you get from, from the stoners against legalization is it doesn't legalize enough people who still grow eight plants would go to prison if there's a limit of six or people who grow 12 by 12 gardens would still go to prison if there's a 10 by 10 limit, whatever, right? They, they point to whatever the limit is. And well, people above that limit would still go to prison, so we have to oppose it. And the problem with that thinking is that's not entirely true. In the circumstance you live in now under prohibition, cops have probable cause upon finding the merest speck or seed or stem or trip to the garden store or fertilizer bags in your garbage and all sorts of electric bill usage, all sorts of ways they have to build a case to get the warrant to break into your house to find out that you've got the too many plants or too big a garden. When you legalize even a little bit, you set yourself up so that you've got a, uh, a shield against most of the probable cause that gets you to the point of getting busted. And I, this is not theoretical. In Washington state where they legalized just an ounce and no home grow and maintained a felony for 40 grams of marijuana, charges for all marijuana crimes dropped by 63%. Not just the people who had less than an ounce, but people who were growing, people that had a quarter pound, people that had extracts, charges for everything dropped 63%. So legalize it and then work out the details later. I know nothing, nothing. Hey, it's 20 after the hour here. Well, it's 20 after the hour everywhere, except the time zones that are on the half hour, where it's 50 after the hour, and the time zones that are on the 15 or the 45 after the hour, which I'm not going to do the base 60 math to figure out. <laughs> but happy 20 after wherever you're at. Happy 420 to the folks in the Mountain Time Zone. When we come back, we got Maya Salovitz and coerced treatment. Warning. Hits taken on this show are larger than they appear. Do not try this at home. These people are professionals. Or at least they pay me to say that. The Russ Belville Show is proudly sponsored by the Marijuana Business Association. The MJBA, called by NBC News the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, is the fastest growing business association in the fastest growing industry in America. I've been working with the MJBA for years and I personally invite you to join the MJBA. MJBA also publishes the popular MJ Headline News on Facebook and the MJNewsNetwork.com and Marijuana Channel One on YouTube. Visit MJBA.net for more details. Dr. Dabber, hurry! Its temperature is shooting past 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's burning up! I'm afraid for this little guy, it's just too late. What caused the problem? 
Only Dr. Dabber can maintain the perfect temperature for a smooth tasting, slower burn. This standard vaporizer lost all of its health benefits, sending it up in smoke. So you're telling me that most vapor pens burn so hot they produce smoke, not vapor? Correct. Keep away from those standard vaporizer pens and turn to Dr. Dabber. Doctor's order. Less heat, <laughs> more flavor. At Herbie's Cannabis Seeds, we pride ourselves on bringing you the best quality seeds from the world's most respected cannabis seed producers, all at the lowest online prices. You can find Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. All cannabis seeds are sold as souvenirs and as a means of preserving cannabis genetics. Herbie's Seeds in no way intends to condone, promote, or incite the use of illegal or controlled substances. We strongly urge all prospective customers to check their national laws prior to placing an order. Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. Proud sponsors of The Russ Belville Show and 420 Radio. Gondrepreneur.com, your guide to the cannabis business world. Gondrepreneur.com is a comprehensive resource for cannabis professionals and entrepreneurs. Download the Gondrepreneur app on your smartphone or tablet to catch up on cannabis industry news, scroll through our daily job listings, and learn about successful cannabis companies, executives, and investors. Gondrepreneur.com, helping Gondrepreneurs grow. Saban began the women's movement to end alcohol prohibition. Four years later, the 21st Amendment was passed. Women are crucial to ending adult marijuana prohibition, and we celebrate women's marijuana activism in a segment we call Ladies of Legalization. Welcome back, everybody. For this segment, we go back to the International Drug Policy Reform Conference uh, held in Arlington, Virginia, right near the Pentagon. And uh, I'm still unpacking a lot of the audio. There was just so much to record from those sessions. And one of the best sessions I attended had to do with drug courts and coerced drug treatments. And one of my favorite people was on the panel, Maya Salovitz, the writer for Time Healthland who focuses on addiction and drug war issues. We begin with her part at the conference with this little clip. Yeah, I, I just want to say that um, the whole idea of coercion in treatment is based on a fallacy, which is addiction is defined by compulsive behavior despite negative consequences. Negative consequences is another word for punishment. If negative consequences work to stop addiction, addiction would not exist. So the whole thing that this is based on is this idea that we need to hit bottom, we need to break you, we need to like, you know, make you do horrible labor and we need to tell you you're a piece of crap and all of this stuff is based on this idea that more that what people with addiction need to get better is more punishment. And what harm reduction shows us is actually what people need to get better is more compassion. Yeah. And yep. Yep. <laughs> thank you. And when 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 treatment is based on this like we're gonna grind you into the ground thing and we know it has a ten percent success rate, why would anybody voluntarily show up for that? Why would they? No rational person would. Again, in contrast People show up for needle exchange. People show up for Howard's program, which is wonderful and, and motivates people and, and meets people where they're at. When you stop thinking that people with addiction are out there having a ton of fun and we need to just interrupt them and like drag them in because they're just having too much fun and pleasure, um, you know, this is, you know, right. And, and so, the whole course of model is just completely backwards. If if it worked, we wouldn't be sitting here. So we're gonna pass the microphone to Denise, but on the way as it travels, I'm just gonna say, going back to drug testing real quickly, there is also an overlay of drug testing that is quite uh, spooky and uh, uh, terrifying in the sense of our notion of our increasing society of surveillance and how much information the government has about us, quantifies about us, puts in computers, and spreads out about us. And drug testing is exactly that type of information uh, that is put there and can be then spread uh, about us. Um, and so uh, there's this notion uh, of drug testing 
being a linchpin in loss of privacy on one hand, but also the notion uh, that when you enter a system of coerced treatment, your relationship as a patient, they'll call, they'll, they'll call you a client, a patient to a medical or treatment provider is fundamentally perverted because the confidentiality, the confidentiality that normally pertains between doctor and patient is no longer in the context of coerced treatment because there's a judge, there's a probation officer, or there's some other law enforcement official who has access to all that information that your treatment provider does uh, as well. And so what's viewed as a central part of therapy, confidentiality, is destroyed and blown out the window in the context of coerced treatment. So I wanted to add that overlay to, direct, to do the drug testing quagmire. Denise, yeah. You know, I think what's increasingly clear to me as, you know, I, I'm not someone that's attended drug reform conferences before, but what's increasingly clear to me is that we live in different realities, right? So when we talk about um, surveillance, for example, as increasing surveillance, that's something that has never ended in communities of color, that often, or the, the basis of the wealth of this country <clears throat> is in colonization and the enslavement of people. Um, so that colonization has never ended for our communities. Um, but in specifically when we look at drug tests, often as we talk about mass incarceration, um, we talk about losing men of color and why black men, indigenous men, um, while they make up the biggest number, the fastest growing number are black and indigenous and other women of color. And so we have to look specifically at that content when we think about drug testing. In Tennessee, um, they have recently passed a bill that women are allowed to be charged with felony assault charges um, if, their, if their child tests positive for neonatal abstinence syndrome. <clears throat> so, when we think about the context, you know, this isn't new for communities of color that you're criminalized when getting health care, but we need to think about how dangerous that is, in particular for pregnant women, um, and not just because they're carrying children, but for their own lives as well. Um, so in New Mexico, our particular context is, you know, some hospitals have tried to take a more progressive context and said, oh, we're only going to drug test people if we feel there's a real danger. Um, and some hospitals are just testing every single person um, that comes into the hospital and is pregnant. Um, but what it looks like is the exact same thing, because the only people that get profiled for drug tests are people that are young parents, um, that have track marks on their arms, um, are people that have darker skin, and so we see the exact same policies. So sometimes when we see this progressive movement, we don't have the lived effects for people in our communities. Thank you, Daniel. I want to say something. I want you to take a look at this same issue from the experience of a drug addict, where you're doing something to yourself every day, many times a day, that you know is crazy. It's madness, and you cannot stop yourself. There is some part of you inside that is craving to be stopped. That yes, you want somebody to stop you from what you're doing to yourself. The stealing, the risks, the disease, the madness. And so, so the criminal justice system, on some level, steps in and stops you. I mean, on some level, that's what I wanted. On some level, because I was totally out of control. And that's what you're dealing with when you're dealing with addiction. It's not just these nice people who are, who are just, you know, dipping and dabbing and getting a little buzz on now and again. No, these people, we're, we're breaking into your fucking apartments. We're ripping you off in the street. We're doing stupid, crazy shit. So the criminal justice sim sips, steps in. Is that so bad? Is it okay if I say something? Is that so bad? <laughs> I would, Real quick. I, uh, okay. Is that so bad? I'm going to tell the truth. 
if you are yeah, committing crimes bad. that are harming other people and that are predatory, absolutely yep. the criminal justice system should step in there. Mm -hmm. If you are doing nothing but harming yourself, I don't think so. Um, and I think that if the that you know there's lots of people with addictions that do not do that stuff, um, and that obviously a lot of that has to do with privilege, um, but it is a complicated you know if you've met one person with addiction you've met one person with addiction it is not we are not all the same yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but i will say that if we want a better drug court system the way to go about it would be is yes if somebody's committing a real crime that's harming the community and we got to do something about that so what we should have i would think is that the judge should say Right, you're committing these crimes, you obviously have a substance use disorder, here's a list of multiple, multiple treatment options, go for it. Okay, I'm going to put you on hold there, because we're actually going to turn to that next, and we're going to design a system very shortly, but I need to do a little data dump on you all, <laughs> based on this last little interchange, which is, as, as Maya said, if you uh, have a drug problem and are harming others, you ought to have access to treatment perhaps through the criminal justice system because you're harming others and your underlying condition has a drug component to it. But here's the fact. Most drug courts in the United States, and by most I'm talking well over 95%, do not create eligibility for people in their drug courts who harm others. Drug courts for the vast majority are only open to people who are caught with drugs or test positive for drugs or are using drugs, yep. many of whom are themselves not drug dependent. And so these are people filling our drug courts who are not harming others, yep. and many of whom might not be addicted or dependent. And so that's something we need to know when we're talking about how we're employing our drug treatment in our criminal justice system in days diversion alternatives. So that's one fact. Maya alluded to the a statistic less than 10% of people who go into drug courts are successful in drug courts. Uh, and there's lots of data out there. And I, I asked our panelists not to be data heavy on this panel and cite lots of studies. I do want to tell you where those studies can be found. Many of them can be found in Maya's writings over the years. Others can be found in an excellent publication by the Open Society Foundation. Uh, that Daniel Wolf has contributed to about drug courts that analyzes all the data and all the studies uh, that have been done on drug courts in the United States uh, and elsewhere. And that publication is in the publications in the, uh, on the table, on the Open Society Foundation table, on the publications table. Uh, drug Policy Alliance has also collected the data. And you can find the data showing the lack of ac efficacy of drug treatment uh, through drug courts. But if that is the background, and some of this is new to some of you in this room, if that's the basic background, that drug courts don't really treat people who harm others, who would benefit most in society, who would benefit most from having treatment, and they're not providing good treatment, and it's failing most people who go through those court systems, why do they have such a great, solid reputation across the board in the United States? Why is their media the media, when you read that open, when you open the paper or see an article about drug courts, it's always positive. And so I want to ask the two people who have some journalistic background on our panel, uh, Alice in a former life and, and Maya in a current life, why have drug courts gotten a pass in the public perception and none of these criticisms are being heard really outside this room? I'll start with that, and, and my background is I was a, a journalist uh, for 31 years before, uh, about seven years ago, I decided to take off the, the gloves and be a real advocate. And so um, uh, I think the reason is that the, the, you know, the criminal justice system and the you know, industrial uh, you know, capitalist system has basically bought into the drug court as an easy solution that, you know, according to the evidence that people have put out, and you know, but that has gotten the attention, saves money. You know, it's the kind of thing that people who are looking for simplistic solutions can latch on to. And um, while there are lots of smart and industrious and journalists who like to dig into things, 
Um, there also are many people who are taking what's fed to them in the, it, you know, in the media, and the more we see the, the media expanding into anybody being able to put out anything that they, you know, they choose that there are few, fewer filters, which is both good and bad in terms of the amount of information is out. It's very hard to change a narrative that's out there. However, and I think, you know, it's up to us to help by providing journalists with this other view um, in ways that are very easy for journalists to take and run with. So that's stories of people who have been you know, totally harmed by uh, um, you know, drug, drug courts. That's stories that tell, that's what journalists are looking for and looking for you know, a simple fact sheet that sums up the fact that the evidence is really lacking and that if you take this and really look at the evidence for drug courts, it's not there. And to, to have that, so you need that to con contradict the messages coming from politicians and the, sort of the, the, the pathway. And one other thing I want to say is that I think there's a counter um, trend that's happening in the healthcare system that could be used as part of that argument um, and, and, and um, you know pitch to make to journalists, which is the movement in healthcare right now is you know looking at the complex underlying issues in healthcare and looking, stepping back and saying, we can't just treat people with healthcare, we need to look at social and economic determinants. Um, there are multiple um, uh, innovative programs that are being funded by all different sources, philanthropy, the government, et cetera, looking at how do we build a better mousetrap for, you know, for building together health and social services, essentially, very similar to the harm reduction model, diversion model that people have been talking about. You need all those things. And at the heart of that is that the best, you know, people get better when they're, they have voluntary treatment and when they're engaged in their own health. And that issue about self-empowerment and uh, self-engagement is a whole other movement that's going on in healthcare. So I really think we can use those things um, to help turn, the, you know, the, the dime on this. Thanks. Um, uh, so, with regard to the media and drug courts, the media has this sort of false objectivity thing going on, and they love solutions that appear to be in the middle between left and right. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason that um, that there has been a real love for drug courts. The other reason, um, I actually think the success rate is actually 50%, not 10%. The 10% I was citing was the um, rate for um, uh, drug treatment long term. Um, and it's actually 10 to 20%, to be fair. Um, but the 50% um, the has to be understood in the context of that these people are selected to be the ones most likely to succeed before they get into the program in the first place. Um, so that cherry picking of clients. Should, yeah, that should be taken with a grain of salt there. Um, I think, you know, the way the media also looks at this, um, you know, we, the media has been the biggest purveyor of this idea that you need to hit bottom before you can get better. And the drug courts, you know, Martin Sheen's out there saying we need the hammer to get people into drug courts. Yeah, that worked really well. Um, but, you know, again, um, until we get rid of this idea that what people with addiction need is more trauma and more punishment and more harm, um, you know, the media is going to keep up with this sort of 12-step narrative about sin and redemption. Um, so. Thanks. Absolutely. The other thing uh, with the media is that they're taking um, what they hear and they're not delving into it because they're comfortable with the attitude that, all right, these people aren't going to jail. Treatment is better than jail, so they need to be soft on that. So instead of asking a direct question, even when there's a 50% um, supposedly success rate through drug treatment courts, is out of that 50% that's left over, if they're not succeeding and sober through through the drug court, they're either incarcerated or they're dead. They don't count how many are dead. So you have had over 20 years of these drug courts with say 50% success rate. You said how many people are going through a year, 125,000 people? If it's only 50%, then every year, the other 50%, which you, we don't know, how many are in jail and how many die? They do not count it anywhere. So when, you're, when they start to talk about if a journalist would, would delve into the numbers and ask the right questions or force the National Association of Drug Court Professionals to ask the right questions in their research, 
then maybe we would get somewhere, but they don't. And when the drug courts evaluate, the, um, or when they do the evaluations of the drug courts, that's all self-reported. And there's target goals that they're trying to meet, and it has nothing to do with the health of the people that are going through the courts at all. It was an illuminating panel, and I'll have the entire panel uploaded to my SoundCloud page. I can't tell you when, but just follow me on SoundCloud. You'll get the update when it uploads. And yeah, consider how many of those drug courts pad their stats by having a whole bunch of pot smokers who aren't really addicted to anything ending up in there and then successfully completing treatment on the threat of pee tests that can send you to jail. Of course they have great success rates. All right, stay tuned. We're going to talk about Oregon banning cannabis cafes at the start of the year and uh, why that's incredibly hypocritical. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Get the latest updates on the Russ Belleville Show by following Radical Russ on Twitter and liking the Russ Belleville Show on Facebook. This is Radical Russ encouraging you to take a look at the Weed Blog every day. Johnny Green and the staff at the Weed Blog are on top of all the latest developments in the fight to end marijuana prohibition nationwide. You can even get the Weed Blog on your smartphone by installing the Weed Blog app for iPhone and Android. It's about weed. It's on the Weed Blog, including my original writing. So don't delay. Read the Weed Blog today. Your connection to quality cannabis insurance services is spelled K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R. That's Karcher Insurance. We have worked with ventures like cannabis for over 60 years. We're proud to represent over 50 companies with tailor-made cannabis business plans for owners just like you to insure your product, your plants, and your pursuits. K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R spells out their full-service insurance services, ranging from commercial to bonds, to personal, from life to health, and more. Contact the team at CarcherInsurance.com and let our experience work for you. That's K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R Insurance.com. Contact Karen and the team at Karcher Insurance at 1-844-421-3560. That's 844-421-3560. Public enemy number one. I support a change in law to end federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. That marijuana, pot, grass, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most dangerous drug. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make them. I experimented with marijuana a time or two, and I didn't like it and didn't inhale. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. Entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Radical rant. I received an email from Madeline Martinez, the proprietress of the world-famous Cannabis Cafe here in Portland, Oregon, and it stated that the Oregon Health Authority stopped by to inform us that effective January 2016, we will no longer be able, no longer be allowed to consume indoors. Of course, she means to consume marijuana indoors. And uh, the Cannabis Cafe is one of at least three such cannabis clubs that have opened up in Portland. There's one called The Other Spot and one that's opened recently on Powell called the Northwest Cannabis Club. And it's important to note, none of these clubs sell any marijuana. The The marijuana laws here don't allow for on-site consumption at dispensaries. And if you're going to sell marijuana, you have to be a dispensary. Um, in fact, no public consumption whatsoever. We can't smoke at bars or anything else. But these clubs have always been BYOB you know, bring your own buds. And so they're run by volunteers and they've considered themselves private clubs and they require entry through the purchase of, you can pay a daily door fee or a monthly membership or some combination thereof. They don't sell any alcohol or tobacco. 
Uh, and uh, sometimes they'll sell snacks, chips, sandwiches, whatever, sodas. But um, it looks like they may all be in danger of closing because according to the health authority, thanks to the passage of House Bill 2546, that changes Oregon law. Uh, this bill was crafted to deal with the emerging technology of e-cigarettes and cannabis vaporizers. So it adds in this definition of an inhalant delivery system and it updates the law. So there's the prohibitions and penalties for the use of vaporizers for minors, just like we forbid cigarettes for minors. So yeah, law needed to be updated because, you know, these e-cigarettes we're, you know, kind of skirting some of Oregon's laws about, uh, you know, cigarettes with minors and all that. But also included in this House Bill 2546 is a section updating the Oregon Clean Air Act. You know, the anti-indoor smoking laws, right? In Section 16 of the bill, it amends Oregon law to say a person may not smoke aerosolize or vaporize an inhalant or carry a lighted smoking instrument in a public place or place of employment. Uh, they do have the exception for medical facilities if you're on medical marijuana, but a person may not smoke, aerosolize, or vaporize an inhalant in a public place. And now you got your definitions, right? A public place means an enclosed area open to the public. So... A building, even, I suppose, an outdoor, you know, fenced off area would be enclosed. And then an inhalant means nicotine, a cannabinoid, or any other substance that is inhaled for the purpose of delivering the nicotine, cannabinoid, or other substance into the person's respiratory system. Now, don't worry. They did carve out the exceptions for like asthma inhalers and <laughs> that kind of stuff. But what the penalty now, the penalty for allowing smoking or vaping to happen in your club will be up to a maximum of $500 per day. And so, you know, these cannabis clubs, you know, getting by on volunteers and door fees can't add another $500 a day to their, you know, operating expenses. So why do we have to shut down private clubs that aren't selling weed, just allowing cannabis consumers to exercise their First Amendment right to free assembly? Why must we stop them from doing such a thing? Well, we'll tell you, in House Bill 2546, it says... The people of Oregon find that because exposure to secondhand smoke, certain exhaled small particulate matter or other exhaled toxins is known to cause cancer and other chronic diseases such as heart disease, asthma, and bronchitis, it is necessary to reduce exposure to such smoke, matter, or toxins by prohibiting the smoking, aerosolizing, or vaporizing of inhalants in all public places and places of employment. So this is what the, I mean, it, the Clean Air Act used to say, you know, because of exposure, secondhand smoke is known to cause cancer. We have to prohibit smoking in all public places and places of employment. And that, now I disagree. I think that we can have places where people could smoke and we could find ways around, you know, dealing with it. I mean, my God, we allow West Virginia people to be coal miners. And the lung damage from being a coal miner is far worse than being a waitress in a restaurant. But I digress. Even if you disagree with a law like I do, at least it had some sort of rational scientific backing. There is considerable scientific literature about the health danger of secondhand tobacco smoke. And that previous, the previous justification that the exposure to secondhand smoke is known to cause cancer and other chronic diseases such as heart disease, asthma, and bronchitis. We have to reduce exposure to smoke by prohibiting the smoking in all public places and places of employment. That works for me. That's a logical statement. 
But what they've amended in is they've shoehorned in this phrase, certain exhaled small particulate matter or other exhaled toxins. And then added, we have to reduce exposure to the talk, the matter or toxins by prohibiting aerosolizing or vaporizing. Look, the science is not established on secondhand e-cigarette vapor, much less cannabis vapor. Now, I looked, I looked up in PubMed because you know me, I look shit up. Uh, there does seem to be some studies on the harm of secondhand e-cigarette vapor. And what I did find shows that it's far less harmful than secondhand tobacco smoke far less harmful and the e-cigarettes themselves are a harm reduction alternative to conventional tobacco cigarettes why would we want to disincentivize people from using those but when it comes to secondhand cannabis and and this is whether we're talking secondhand smoke or secondhand vapor there's no scientific backing to the notion that it might cause cancer or other chronic diseases such as heart disease asthma and bronchitis what little okay there's some research on smoking cannabis chronically that leads to bronchitis. I'll give them that one. But what little research there is on secondhand cannabis smoke, right? Direct cannabis smoking, bronchitis, I'll give you that one. But not heart disease, not asthma, and certainly not cancer when we've seen cancer, less cancer incidence in regular cannabis smokers. But we're talking secondhand cannabis smoke and what few studies there are focus on whether it causes bystanders to test positive on workplace drug screens on the urine tests, right? Researchers found, quote, positive tests are likely to be rare, end quote, and that in a second test, quote, Room ventilation has a pronounced effect on exposure to secondhand cannabis smoke, end quote. Now, these studies get done because workers try to sue to get out of getting fired from failing a P test by saying, but I was just in a room with people that were smoking pot. It was secondhand. And they're like, no, secondhand cannabis smoke can't make you fail a test. So if secondhand cannabis smoke can't make you fail a P test, how can it be having a deleterious effect on the people in a cannabis club. But despite the state deciding that it needs to protect us from secondhand cannabis smoke and vapor, the state does allow an exception for people who want to gather and smoke, not vaporize, smoke tobacco. Yes. The Oregon Health Authority will certify smoke shops these are businesses that do at least 75% of their business in tobacco products and allow for the sampling of tobacco products. You'll be able to go to a place that sells smoke, sells tobacco, which we know the smoking of causes cancer, emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart disease, and we know the secondhand smoke of it causes all sorts of problems as well. That'll be okay, as long as it's a smoke shop. And Oregon Health Authority will also certify cigar bars. Cigar bars that have a capacity of 40 persons or fewer and allow only for the smoking of cigars. That'll be just fine. Even though that's tobacco and we have scientific evidence that the secondhand smoke from that is really bad, even though that's the whole damn reason we came up with these clean air acts in the first place was because the tobacco secondhand smoke was so awful. We'll allow smoke shops and we'll allow cigar bars that can have up to 40 people in them. That'll be okay. Oregon Health Authority will sign off on that. That's copacetic. That's just fine. And both these cigar bars and smoke shops have to abide by regulations for adequate ventilation. Okay. Good. And both must absolutely forbid the smoking or vaporizing of cannabinoids on their premises. No, by God, we don't want you inhaling something that might help reduce your risk of cancer. We're the Oregon Health Authority. So... When you boil this all down, all indoor consumption of cannabis must be banned, even if it's vaporized, which produces no known secondhand harm, 
even when adequate ventilation eliminates any chance of this unknown harm. No cannabis, can't have it, no indoor, no outdoor, no private clubs. It's all banned, can't do it. The only place you can smoke pot is in your house. But of course, if you're on Section 8 housing, you can't do that. And of course, if your landlord uh, says no smoking, you can't do that. So a whole bunch of people out there have this right to smoke cannabis, but no place to exercise this right. No cannabis smoking at indoor clubs, no private clubs. No, by God, we can't have that. But we can have exceptions for indoor consumption of tobacco, even when smoked, which we know produces toxic secondhand effects, just so long as there's adequate ventilation. <laughs> wow. So here in the Pacific Northwest, following Washington's legislature, which felonized any club. I guess I guess uh, Oregon's got it good. Ours is just a $500 fine per day. Washington's legislature felonized any club that would dare to allow indoor cannabis consumption. And now Oregon will be fining cannabis clubs out of existence. Meanwhile, Coloradoans are continuing to lobby for indoor consumption rights. Alaska has gone ahead and allowed for indoor public cannabis consumption. And the leading 2016 legalization initiatives in Maine, Massachusetts, and California all allow for some sort of on-site public consumption. It's time for the leaders in the Pacific Northwest to recognize what a tragic mistake they are making in not licensing indoor cannabis consumption, some sort of cannabis clubs. The Pacific Northwest is such an amazing tourist destination that somebody who wants to enjoy cannabis where it is legal and has a set of states to choose from might now be choosing Maine or Massachusetts instead of visiting Oregon or Washington. Might be choosing the rocky coast of Maine over the rocky coast of Washington. Might be choosing California. They can sit on a warm beach and maybe go to some cannabis club and enjoy some cannabis while they're there, legally. I can't emphasize this enough. Pacific Northwest, Washington, and Oregon. You must come up with a legal place for people to consume cannabis. It makes no sense for people to have a right and have no place to exercise that right. Some people live in places where they cannot consume cannabis. They should have some bar to be able to go to. And if we've learned to accept bars on every street corner in some of our cities that cause so much more harm than a cannabis club ever possibly could, it's time to end the madness and get them licensed. That's all the time I got for Hour 1. Stay tuned. Your call's next in Hour 2, Toker Talk Radio. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth.